Uh, it's exciting to be here. Um, Professor Bob has given me the biggest challenge in my life to reduce a discussion that would ordinarily take three or four days down to one hour or one day, and so on. It's an exciting challenge. So let me see how far we can get with all of this. So I'm going to try to put it all together to give you a narrative, the narratives are important to try to tell, to bring all the pieces together and um, as we go along I will add a little, a few details here and there. But mainly I want to give you the narrative of trying to weave it all together and to uh, explain to you as best I can um, how an Arab Islamic civilization developed, uh, where it started to go and then it didn't go and then hopefully, if we can, we'll move on to, to, to Europe. And perhaps uh, in the second session, I can say a few things about, about China. Now, first of all, we need some simplifying ideas. The compared history of science presumably wants to understand how it was possible for modern science to arise in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries, and at the same time, to understand why Arabic Islamic science faltered and stagnated, and says, as also did science in China. Now, naturally, we can't uh, explore all of that terrain in one hour, but we can begin an analysis, analysis of Islam and science, and then move on to Europe and perhaps to China. In trying to understand the nature of scientific inquiry in these three situations, we are looking at very complex cultural configurations. There is no one thing one factor that explains it all it is rather, a, rather a, a complex of factors, some of which, of course, could be rated more highly than others. But in diagnosing these situations um, and their congeniality to science, it is rather like diagnosing a medical condition. Whether or not you are healthy or ill depends on a constellation of factors, such as your height, your weight, your diet, your blood pressure and how much exercise you get, maybe even your genetic makeup, and so on. And so that is the kind of analysis we have to do with our subject matter. But in this case, we have to consider religious ideas, legal ideas, legal conceptions, as well as philosophical and metaphysical ideas. And above all, we have to study how these ideas were institutionalized or not, and how those institutions shaped and patterned behavior. Now clearly we are not interested in who first invented gunpowder block printing or the compass. Inventions of no uh, scientific consequence for, our, for understanding our topic. Instead we are interested in what progress was made in the discovery of the fundamental forces of nature, in the structure of matter and its transformation. That is to say Science is about the general principles that govern and regulate the natural world. To take this one step further, we want to understand what range of scientific disciplines facilitated and enabled Europeans, that is Sir Isaac Newton and his contemporaries, to arrive at that grand synthesis of terrestrial and celestial motion governed by the universal law of gravitation. That is, the new science of mechanics that was announced in 1687. Now, if we take this outcome as a clue about the range of scientific disciplines that were necessary to get us there, then we can narrow the field down to four disciplines. First, we would have the study of motion in the, in the natural world. This came to be called physics. It was even called that Fusus Nature by the Greeks and later the science of mechanics. Secondly, um, we would need some kind of mathematics. It turns out it doesn't have to be the most advanced mathematics in the world, but you do have to have some. Thirdly, we have to have the ongoing study of the heavens, which would of course be astronomy, which in those days passed as astrology. And fourthly, probably some advance in the science of optics. Above all, the invention of lenses or lens technology in order to develop more precise instruments of observation. Although both Copernicus and Johannes Kepler used old-fashioned naked eye 
observations to achieve their results. Now, in saying this, I do not mean to dismiss the study of medicine. It, it was important, especially with regard to the study of anatomy, um, and later the emergence of biology as a general science, but if we trace out the comparative history of medicine, we get the same result. Western success and non-Western retardation. Now, from a technical or internal point of view, if some scholars around the world were doing some kind of empirical inquiry, maybe studying plants and animals, uh, perhaps looking for potent drugs, but we're not advancing our four prime areas of inquiry, then um, they are not going to end up with modern science. They are not on the same page. Now, we can't say, oh, this is just an arbitrary Western Eurocentric uh, distinction, because without the advances of modern science in Europe, we would not have the Industrial Revolution, we wouldn't have electricity, and of course, we wouldn't have the Digital Revolution, nor would we, of course, have um, all the advances of modern medicine. <clears throat> So the successful pursuit of science, or of modern science, was achieved by focus research in particular directions, and it had huge consequences for our whole planet. Secondly, we need to consider what I shall call the sociocultural context of science. That is, the whole constellation of social factors that either aided <clears throat> or impeded the study of the natural sciences. Clearly, some social and cultural arrangements are more conducive to the pursuit of science than others. Okay, I don't know if I can make this uh, thing to work, uh, but I want to do some, just a brief um, historical thing to get us on the same page. Which way do I point this? Uh, okay, I can't see this. Um, all right, so, but, uh, is this my first time? I can't really tell. Let's go back. Okay, yeah, it is. All right. Okay, so here is a map. You can see that um, the first transmission of Greek philosophy was to Alexandria, and I've got 322 BC um, when the great, uh, the huge Greek corpus went to well, went to Alexandria, and then I got a red line down below in the for the eighth century when actually those uh, materials were transported to Baghdad. But of course, later on in um, the 8th century, they were also transmitted directly from Greece to, to Baghdad. Uh, with regard to the Alexandria-Baghdad um, transfer, there is uh, some kind of myth about the Arabs burning all the books in the library, but they probably didn't. They actually loaded up, I, I think, something like 40 donkeys or whatever, camels, and took them to Baghdad. In any case, I just want you to be aware of that. Then eventually, of course, the green line is when all of this comes back to Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries. Oops, wrong way. Okay, I just want to remind you that the, that the Greek um, ecumene, the Greek greater uh, cultural and economic area, includes Asia Minor to the right there, and notice Pergamon is number one there. That's where Galen came from, as did many other Greeks come from both sides, you see, of what we usually think of as, as Greece, but in fact it was partly in Asia Minor. So that's the larger Greek um, oikos that um, we just need to be reminded of. So here it is, the pre-Islamic Middle East. Notice the Arabian Peninsula is undeveloped. You have the Sasanian or Persian Empire to the right, and then the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire clearly uh, takes up most of the area on, uh, in and around the Mediterranean all the way to North Africa and the Straits of Gibraltar. And then we have the Islamic expansion um, around up to 750, and you can see that the Arab Islamic civilization expanded rather dramatically all across the Middle East, going east to um, Iraq, Iran, um, and um, what would be Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and then butts up against the Byzantine Empire that still, at that point, holds a large part of Anatolia. And of course, uh, all of Greece and uh, Macedonia and north through the Balkan uh, areas and um, southern Italy. Um, but anyway, the Muslims made the uh, um, forceful 
movement across the Middle East, across the Straits of Gibraltar, and into Spain, where in around 732 they were halted in southern France. Okay. Now, I just want, I'm just putting this up here. I gave you all this, uh, this uh, um, timeline so we're all on the, on the same page and you, you know roughly the Arabic Islamic history. What um, I would point to, perhaps significantly here, would be, um, of course, Muhammad invited Khadija to marry him. She didn't ask him, he asked. She asked her, he didn't ask him. That would have changed after Islam, of course, appeared. Now, 622 is zero time. The Hajira to Medina, or Yathra. Muhammad is invited to go to Yathra as a prophet or at least a religious counselor, and he goes. This is the beginning of Islamic time. And then I've got in there for you other uh, demarcations for the development of Islam across the, the Middle East and so on. You have the four rightly guided caliphs after the death of Mecca, uh, sorry, the death of Muhammad in Mecca in 632. You have the four rightly, so called rightly guided um, um, caliphs, and that means successor to the Prophet Abu Bakr, Uthman, sorry, Umar, and Uthman, and then Ibn Ali. And um, it's only toward the end of that, under Uthman, that the Quran is put together and published and um, is uh, um, taken around the Middle East. And then 661, the um, people in charge, the military men, begin to spread Islam, for going to Damascus and setting up the Umayyad dynasty, and so on. Okay, so you, you have that history, and uh, let me just go on one now to the next. Okay. All right, so now let's turn to some of the historical materials. Starting with the Greeks. I know that in our multicultural world, some commentators want to believe that the Greeks and their achievements were just one of many cultural arrangements that now comes of no special importance. But having studied this question for a number of decades, I come back, I return to the view that the ancient Greek contribution to the study of philosophy and the natural sciences was unique, that it was not equaled by any other peoples of our globe, and indeed with hindsight, appears to have been indispensable. And this is my short list of the um, Greek works um, that were translated into Arabic by Christians and Jews um, roughly between 750 AD and 950 AD. But notice first this. When the Arabs burst onto the scene in the Middle East about 660, they're moving now out of Mecca and going to Damascus and establishing their headquarters there, and beginning of the Islamic civilization, if you will. When they burst onto the scenes, the Arab world had no serious high culture, for neither Greek, Byzantine, nor Roman or law or philosophy had penetrated the Arabian Peninsula. The <clears throat> The Arabs were very proud, once their book was compiled, of their book, and this comes up if you go to the Middle East and talk to the Muslims, they say, what do you think of our book? And I say, good. Okay, and, and so, um, otherwise they did not have, they were not a literate culture, they did not have a high culture, and so on. So, um, they knew something of Judaism and Christianity, but it was very sketchy knowledge with little depth and largely word-of-mouth knowledge uh, of the transmission of Judaism and Christianity. And as I said, for Muslims, 622, the Hijira to Medina is zero time, the beginning of time for, for Muslims, so that everything before that is Jahiliya, the time of barbarism, debauchery, and no culture or morality, so they say. Consequently, Muslims were uninterested in Greek or Byzantine history. Roman law, Roman history. Even Middle Eastern scholars today notice the difficulty of Muslim students coming to grips with their prehistory and really have very little knowledge of contemporary Roman and Byzantine civilizations and their origin. And of course, they are not. No, no Arab scholars, Muslims, are interested in looking at what were the possible sources of the Quran in Christianity and Judaism. But there are European scholars who are doing this but they do it uh, rather um, undercover. 
No less about 100 years after the founding of the Umayyad dynasty, and when the capital shifted to Baghdad, about 750, with the Abbasids, Christians and Jews began translating the Greek corpus into Arabic. The high point of his translation effort was probably under Al-Kindi, the so-called philosopher of the Arabs, in Baghdad. So my short list of the most important works in science and philosophy translated into Arabic comes from that period. Without that heritage, there would have been no Arabic science. But with it, the Arabs were placed on a level of intellectual discourse that was higher than any other culture or civilization, including China. In a word, the whole Greek um, philosophical corpus, worldview and metaphysics, which were then called the foreign sciences by the Arabs, were Arabicized, and during that early period, roughly 750 to 1050, Muslim scholars began to deeply explore every part of that heritage, but thereafter they reacted against it, deeply and against its deeply uh, or deeper metaphysical commitments um, of Greek philosophy and science. Um, so let me now make uh, some comments uh, about, about this. I hope I've got it corrected up here. Mm, yeah, okay. Oops. Yeah, ah, sorry. Go back. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, Plato's, is this working? Yeah. Okay, here's the um, Plato's works of translated, but the one thing that was not translated, and I may not have that in your um, handout, the Timaeus, which is the, uh, one of the most concise and important um, summaries of Greek philosophical and scientific thought of that period of time. And in that work, as you know from, maybe you read some of those the papers I gave, the one on the three science and metaphysics and the three religions of the book. There I discussed that, that, that book. Now, in that book, um, Plato says that the world is a rational, ordered um, universe, um, a world system, in fact, that it's rationally ordered, it's governed by causes, but also chance. And human beings are part of this order, and so they are rational, they are reasonable, they have rationality, and furthermore, they have um, philosophy. And philosophy for, for um, Plato is, as I have in the book and uh, in, that, in that essay, and the way Plato puts it, philosophy is that gift greater than which nothing has or shall ever come to humankind. Now, <clears throat> clearly that's... Um, the words of a, of a Greek philosopher. Now the Arabs weren't I'm going to buy this eventually. They first, at first they do. Al-Kindi sort of does buy this. But anyway, that book was not translated into Arabic. There are epitomes of it, but otherwise it was not translated. And I think we can assume that suggests they were nervous about the implication of what Plato was saying. Now, next, of course, we have um, Aristotle's great Organon, which, is, which includes both all of his logical works and then his scientific works, the metaphysics, his uh, book on physics, meteorology, plants and animals, on the heavens, gener generation corruption, all the logical works, and on the soul. All of these things were translated into, into Arabic, and so they had the whole corpus there. It was there. It was given to them as a huge um, platform. Now, just to mention two things, or a couple things that are, again, indispensable. Archimedes, of course, is very important, but Euclid, Euclid's geometry, right? That's a purely Greek invention, and that did come to the, to the Arabs, and they did indeed translate it into many, into many editions, and was very important thereafter. Now, Galen of Pergamon had 16 books on anatomy and medicine. Again, nothing equal like that until the seven, um, 16th, 17th century. And that was only, and only when, um, under the the, um, the work of Europeans, Vesalius was was um, that um, superseded. And then finally, down here, Ptolemy's great book, the Almagest. That means the greatest book, and the Almagest is the Arabic way they they titled that book. Those things, again, don't exist and didn't exist in any other part of the world. They didn't exist in China, they didn't exist in, in India, and so on. So in that sense, they are indispensable. There just wasn't any com comparable kind of thing. Now, what I, what I would suggest, this relates to the question I'll give to you later. Um, you have here a huge um, philosophical, metaphysical, platform that is given, that is set forth by the Greeks. Here Plato says, 
man has reason and rationality. And this is the greatest gift of philosophy, and it means that we can understand the world. Now, Aristotle likewise says, the world is an explicable universe, and the tools of observation and logic can be used to understand it. And we develop understanding or explanations of it by using the tools of logic. And Aristotle actually invented, you see, these tools of logic, the notion of deduction and induction, and under what conditions would such um, demonstrations be valid. Thirdly, you have from both Plato and Aristotle, the notion that nature itself is an organic whole governed by natural causes. Um, causes and development, transformation are built into nature. Now, if you think about that, that means it's somewhat autonomous. It does its thing. But if you take the point of view of a theist, well, God has to be intervening here somehow, doesn't he? So that's a very powerful notion, right? That nature has built into it these, this whole set of causes and uh, mechanisms that are simply there. So we have then a whole scientific, philosophical metaphysics that was given to the Arab Muslim world, but in the end, um, was rejected. they rejected major parts of it. Okay, I don't know what the next slide is. Let me just jump over here, okay? Okay, you know, I, I just put this up here. Um, so sometime in your reading, you'll, uh, if you need to deal with this issue of Aristotle and his teachings and what he thought of science, you can review that. I don't want to take too much time to go into it. Uh, but you, you might notice, however, that mathematics is not a science in Aristotle's reckoning. It's, it's a more formal science that deals with objects that are simply, well, abstract and maybe fictional. Sciences really are uh, natural science, um, natural philosophy, physics, meteorology, and so on and so forth. So you, you just might want to be aware of that in some future day. Uh, okay, that's more just of the, the history of the, of the dynasties. But we really want to, to know, okay, what happened after the golden age of Islam? That's the critical thing. So we have then um, the translation of, and transmission of all of this great Greek wisdom and knowledge uh, above, we, above all the, the scientific uh, uh, works. So what happened? Okay, what happened was that the Arabs and the Muslims began to think about their tradition and they began to shape it in a way that they thought best fit um, what their vision of Islam was. And so they began to develop, shall we say, their own modes of reason and logic, and especially with regard to Islamic law. If we have the Quran and the Hadith, that's the Islamic law, also known as the Sharia, if you have that, um, it is the speech of God, so they think, right? It's a speech of God, but just how does it apply? to particular situations that may come up. You have to figure out how to apply that to the real world. So you've got to have some modes of reason and logic that they began to develop. And so what happened was that Islamic law, the Sharia, came to be the guiding intellectual structure of the Islamic world, and it persisted from that time to today. So the problem that you may find that you have, if you invite the imam of the local mosque to your school or wherever it is, he's going to talk about Islamic law. He's going to talk about what's in the Quran and the Hadith. He is not going to talk philosophy. He is not going to talk theology. He's going to talk Islamic law. And so any discussions that you have with such people to say, well, it's in the Quran. The Quran says this, Quran says that, Hadith says this, Hadith says that. Well, but this Muslim over here is doing that. Well, he's not a good Muslim. So that's where they are. They are not thinking about, well, what if? What if, well, maybe, maybe God thought of it this way or maybe that way. Wouldn't it be possible to do this? No, that isn't the way they think about it. Okay, now the second part, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate a bit more on that when I go to the next slide. Um, the person who developed this would be uh, al Shafi'i. He's uh, one of the four schools of Islamic law. He consolidated Islamic law and, and um, 
shape the modes of logic, which I will, I will come, come back to. But there's only one, one of four schools, and now you may read on the web, there are eight schools of law. Never have been integrated. There's not gonna be any attempt to integrate them. They just are what they are. And only one school was generally taught in the madrasas. We'll come back to that later. Okay, now the other question is, all right, the Greeks gave us this great corpus, right? Um, and it has built into it this, name, this notion that nature is autonomous, self-controlling, self-guiding, and you can understand that. But what if you believe that God is the master of the universe? What if you believe that God is, controls everything? Well, what happened was this person, Al-Ashari, um, developed this whole thing that's called Islamic occasionalism or Islamic um, atomism. And uh, according to this view, God is in control every moment, every minute of, of, of the time. I think if you, um, the, I gave you the essay in the Science of Metaphysics of the Three Religions of the Book, you can just make a note uh, on page 186. Um, that um, Ashari talks about the acts of men are created by God, and a single act comes from two agents of whom one God creates it, while the other man acquires it. So basically he's developing a theological position that eliminates free will, as certainly was understood in the Catholic and the Christian tradition. So um, that idea that um, God controls everything at all times, including people's actions, came to be the dominant view within uh, Islam. And so the capstone of this development would be uh, El Ghazali. Everybody, well, after him, but even Al Ghazali, and above all, after Al Ghazali, um, who develops this into a very powerful uh, philosophical uh, argument. It's somewhat like Humean skepticism that if two things collide, well, is one the cause the other? Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. It gets to these very deep philosophical things. Some people say Al Ghazali was doing that, but I think more than that, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, just for a reference, Al Ghazali is roughly the contemporary of Peter Abelard. And those of you who know anything about Peter Abelard, they are going in totally in a different direction. <clears throat> okay, let's go back now to um, Islamic law. The Islam, Islamic law, as I've said, is composed of the Quran and the Hadiths. Now, the Hadiths are the sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. And the trick was, um, okay, these sayings of the Prophet were not collected until roughly 60 years after Muhammad died. So it's like going back in, what, 1920 or 30 and trying to recover what was said during the Civil War of the United States well, they didn't without anything written down. It's all word of mouth. But uh, nevertheless, that is their argument. So there were people about 60 years after Muhammad died who went about collecting all these sayings of the Prophet. Now the trick was, you have to find the person who originally said it. So if you meet somebody and they say, okay, the prophet said this, then you say, well, how do you know? And he says, well, he got it from Ibn, who got it from Hassan, who got it from Kamal, who got it from... That's called the Isnan, the chain of transmitters. And this is the source of the idea of transmitted knowledge. And for the Muslims, this is the most important knowledge, transmitted knowledge, which means it's religious knowledge. So the rational knowledge, when they might come from the Greeks or others, that's, that's the, they, uh, they understood that was this other rational business. Um, okay, now, all right, so you got the Quran, you got the Hadith, but what if we have a new problem that comes up? How do we deal with it? So you have, first of all, the notion of um, intellectual inquiry or uh, ra ra'i. I don't know if this is on here or not. Nope. Let me just go back. Um, I gave you a handout, but, but um, let's see. Uh, let's try one more. Okay, let's go here. I don't, yeah. Mm. Okay, these are um, four of the roots, so-called roots of law. The first, of course, would be the Quran and the Hadith, and then second would be these things. 
But when they began, when Al, uh, Al Shafi'i began arguing about this and trying to systematize this, the question was, what is the role of reason, some approximation to Western notion of reason, which they generally trans translated as personal opinion. That was the starting point. Well, they said, you can't have personal opinion. It's not, not going to be allowed. So now there is also a notion of ijtihad, which means intellectual struggle in a, in a broad intellectual sense. Um, and jihad, as we know, means struggle. It's jihad simply intellectual struggle. Um, and then we have these other notions. So the argument developed, and Al, and Al Shafei says, okay, um, the modes of reasoning are going to be limited pretty much to this um, third one we're going to call here, kiyas, which means analogy. Whenever you try to uh, figure out what is the right thing to do in a new situation, you have to find an analogy between something that was said in the Quran or in the Hadith and now applies to this. Um, so, um, well, if the Quran says wines are intoxic intoxicating and you shouldn't drink it, okay, what about coffee? When coffee kawata was, was discovered, yeah, it seems to have some kind of funny effects, right? Some kind of um, caffeine in it. Of course, they didn't know it was caffeine. All right, some kind of stimulant. So, okay, if wine is prohibited because of that, then okay, caffeine, well, they didn't know caffeine, but okay, coffee is a stimulant, that's prohibited. So that's what they mean by analogy. It doesn't go off in any wild direction, as Western law does. They make all kinds of analogies to go way beyond anything you can imagine. Um, so their notion of analogy is whatever comparison you're going to make, must be based on something found in the Quran or something in the Hadith. Now, once that has happened, once you have arrived at this consensus, which is the ijma, consensus of whom, well, we assume it's the scholars, once the scholars have agreed upon some inter an interpretation of the application of the Sharia to some particular situation, that's kind of it. You can't change the consensus of the scholars. So now when Muslims ask the question, well, what about um, heart transplants? What about liver transplants? What is that? What, what are we going to do about that? Okay, so you got to go back to the Quran. Well, you're not going to find any, right? So you're stuck. Um, so that's what basically happened. And so once you narrow down the, the, the roots of logic and reason, right, to um, some analogy and then to the, the consensus of the scholars, you're kind of stuck. You can't get beyond that very much. So this is why people have said, certainly with regard to law, the gates of H.T. had, the gates of intellectual freedom were closed roughly in the 9th, 10th century with the death of um, al Shafei. Some people dispute that, but that's roughly the case. So Islamic law didn't change a lot between then and now. And so even now, if you have a question that comes up about any of these things, if a woman loses her husband, can she or can she not marry? What do you do? You go and look at all the um, scholars' writings and the you know, four scholars, the Shafi'is, the Hanabalis, the Hanafis, and uh, the Malikis, and what do they say if someone dies, if a wife loses her husband, can she remarry or not? And you can read uh, their opinions, and that's what you would do to get an answer. And they won't agree exactly, so it's, it's a little problematic. Anyway, the point is that intellectual structure came to dominate Islamic thinking all the way to the present. Um, kalam, K-A-L-A-M, Kalam, or theology, um, was always treated as a second cousin at best. Um, so it, there, wasn't, there wasn't a theological mechanism, shall we say, whereby you could sort of think things out in a, in a new kind of way using reason and logic. That wasn't going to be possible. Um, okay, now the second thing that happened, of course, is with regard to this, this Islamic occasionalism. Uh, that I mentioned, and uh, al, uh, al Ashari. Now, the capstone of that particular strand of thinking, this applies to philosophy and the natural sciences, is Al Ghazali. And if you um, maybe re remember in the essay that I, that I gave you, here's what Ga Ghazali says uh, about these issues. Now, he, uh, he attacked Ibn Sina and Al Farabi, and I think um, Al Razi. 
because these guys, we, we would sort of see them as sort of, sort of, sort of free thinkers, not really free thinkers in any Western sense, but relatively free. They might say, well, philosophers, philosophers are as smart as, 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 as prophets. They can arrive at truths, well, how would they do it? Um, through logic, and whereas prophets are inspired, whatever. But mostly Muslims would never say that. So, Ghazali then drew, wrote this great treatise, which is called The Destruction of um, the Destruction or Destruction of the Philosophers or The Incoherence of the Incoherence. And he's attacking the idea that um, nature has this inner built-in built natural development and so on. Some, sometimes Al Ghazali and others talk about the nature worshippers. Not sure you this, they worship nature because it, it, it can do all these things. So, Ghazali attacks these predecessors, Ibn Sina and others, because they more or less agree that there is this causal dimension to the natural world. So, Ghazali says, according to us, the connections between what is usually believed to be a cause and what is believed to be an effect is not a necessary connection. Each of the two things has its own individuality and is not the other, and neither the affirmation nor the negation, neither the existence nor the non-existence of the one is implied in the affirmation, negation, the existence, and non-existence of the other. Again, this is on page 187 in that essay, Science and the, what is it? Three, Science and Metaphysics and the three, three Religions of the Book. And he says, for example, the satisfaction of thirst does not imply drinking, nor satiety eating, nor burning, contact with fire, nor light, sunrise, nor decapitation, um, death, nor recovery, the drinking of medicine, nor evacuation, the taking of a purgative, and so on, for all the empirical connections existing in medicine, astronomy, the vet sciences, and the crafts. For the connection of these things is based on a prior power of God to create them in successive order. Though not because this connection is necessary in itself and cannot be disjointed, on the contrary, it is God's power to create safety without eating and death without decapitation and to let life persist notwithstanding the decapitation and so on with respect to all connections. So Ghazali puts the kibosh on any idea that there could be um, an independent causal, causally autonomous uh, universe in the natural world or elsewhere. And ever after Ghazali, people took that position. And I witnessed it in Malaysia in 1996. We actually had the discussion, uh, kind of ran out of time, um, where people actually did this very, very kind of thing. Um, all right, shall I move on to the Islamic greats? Um, now, again, remember that um, in general, innovation within religion is um, forbidden. The, the Arabic term was bida. It's forbidden. Any kind of inf innovation within, within religion, you have to distinguish that. Okay, so um, do I have, let's see, do I have here? All right, so what did, what did the Arabs achieve? Can, I don't know if I can quickly put this in here. Um, What's my top category? Okay, astronomy. Um, all right, it turns out that the Arabs did not uh, make any great breakthroughs in astronomy, even though they put huge resources into it. Now, you may have heard that the, uh, the, the um, Arabs, Muslims, um, made lots of observations, and they did. Um, they did, they did, sorry, uh, take that, scratch that. Um, um, they did invent observatories, okay, but in terms of um, producing observations that could be used by astronomers to improve upon the data that Ptolemy had already combined was very difficult. So in effect, the Arabs did not improve on that data, um, but you will read in textbooks that the Arabs made all these observations um, in only a rough sort of sense, but they did not compile any new scientific data that would result in any transformation or change of Ptolemy's Almagest. Okay, now, um, two relative uh, innovations. One would be Altusi, who developed a so-called Tusi couple. It's kind of a, um, a crank mechanism 
which, um, do I have it on here? Let's see. Yeah, there it is. Okay, that's re so the, what, it, what it does is to resolve um, a straight line motion into two circles, one turning fast in the other, one half the uh, radius of the other, um, or diameter of the other. And, and this is in the textbooks. Now it turns out, yes, there is such there is such a device, but if you are a realist, you can't imagine that anything in the skies is really doing that. But it was a way to resolve um, it was a way to resolve a straight line into two circles. Now the reason this comes up is because in Copernicus's um, revolutions of the heavenly spheres, there is a diagram of something like this, but he never explains it, and it's not used to explain anything in the new astronomy. And no one has ever shown that they came from the Arabs. This has been a huge discussion. But no one's ever shown that, that, that um, uh, Copernicus could read Arabic or that he knew it uh, from some Arabic sources. So it seems to be likely that it came sort of independently because there are some Greek scholars actually did something like this. Okay, then uh, the other, the other event, innovation would have been the work of Ibn al Shatter. Let's go back to my list. Is it on here? No. These would be the, the greats who did the most for uh, different parts of the uh, uh, Islamic world. I just go over here. No. Yeah, okay. Ibn Shatta down the bottom here. All right. So Ibn al Shatta was a timekeeper. It's called a Muwakit. And he was a timekeeper in the, in the mosque in Damascus. Um, died died about 1375. He developed some models of the universe um, that were centered on a, a nested sphere of, of uh, nested circles, and um, so it seems. Uh, and, and some of the some of the parameters that he uses are similar to those of Copernicus. But otherwise, there was no great revolution. It didn't re result in transforming the world into a geocentric um, um, worldview. All right, now the, 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 the biggest contribution the Arabs made, I would say, to science was probably um, Ibn al Haytham. He did develop um, the theory of light that light, that light travels in straight lines. And he worked it out mathematically to show how light uh, travels from one place to the other. And he did do experiments. He created the original camera obscura, it wasn't exactly called that, but he did. He created this box, and light came in, and went into another room, and so on. He didn't have lenses, he's just using naked eye and letting light in through this hole that goes into another room. Um, but that turns out that wasn't translated. So that part of his optics wasn't, wasn't translated. But nevertheless, he did. He did um, come up with this new theory of, of that light travels in straight lines, and to figure out where it's going and whatever you want to do with regard to optics, you, can, you, you need to use this, this theory. He didn't invent lenses, he didn't invent anything else, uh, but that's very important, and he was really a genius. Um, now in medicine, there were several very important um, uh, things that were, were, were developed. Let me find this up here. Yeah. One would be the, the lesser circulation of the mm, blood from the heart to, 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 to the lungs. Um, Ibn al-Nafis, who died about 1250, he kind of developed that, but we don't know how he did it because the Arabs rejected dissection, couldn't do dissection. Uh, it was, it was uh, seen as, as a mutilation and you could not and should not do mutilation. Now the other person uh, along in, in the medicine that, that added something quite, quite remarkable was uh, Ibn al um, Kuft, Q U F F. Um, he died in 1286. Both he and Ibn al Nafis, and Nafis died in 1288. They both worked in a hospital in Damascus. Now Ibn uh, al Kuft um, talks about uh, the uh, kind of embryo, and he talks about uh, also valves of the heart. That there are these valves of the heart. Now, how they did it, we don't know because again, um, we just have these manuscripts, and we don't have any any indication that they would do dissections, and they say they did not. Now, the other thing that you hear is, of course, mathematics, and it's true that um, um, they did um, advance or maybe invent um, algebra. Um, Al-Khwarizmi uh, developed algebra, and then you have the development of trigonometry. 
and trigonometry was developed mainly because you want to know what is the direction to pray. If you're in Afghanistan, that's one direction. If you're in Egypt, that's another direction. And if you're in Indonesia, that's another direction. So to work that out, you needed some trigonometry to do that. And that's what they basically used it for. And um, even, uh, sorry, Al Biruni actually worked out a book, wrote a book, and it was sort of directions to Mecca from any place in the world. So he's an extraordinary mathematician, and he in fact did do that. Uh, and, and okay, that's fine. But now what happens is, that both the Hindus and the Arabs say, oh yes, we developed all this, all this mathematics. And so therefore, we paved the way for, for modern science in Europe and blah, blah, blah. Not true. So you ask yourself, okay, how do you get from um, Tamagiz al-Majiz? Uh, 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 al um, how do you get um, to um, the theory of um, Newton that has this whole notion that the planets and the stars are all part of this same motion and set of laws governed by the inverse square law. How do you get there? Turns out that you get there by using geometry, not algebra, not trigonometry, not calculus. It's all geometry. There are no equal signs in the Principia. So the argument that you hear Arabs making, oh, we invented trigonometry, we invented all that, it didn't have any impact. The Europeans didn't like um, algebra. And in fact, uh, in the Copernicus book on the Revolution of the Heavens, you have both use of Roman numerals and some, some Arabic numerals, but he doesn't use algebra or anything like that. And, and also, Newton argues against the use of, of um, algebra because you can't do proofs the way you can in geometry. So, uh, yes, the Arabs did, did advance um, many aspects of mathematics. They did. But that's not science, and that particular aspect of mathematical calculation didn't have any impact on the eventual um, emergence of modern science as we think of it coming out of Newton's Principia Mathematica. Okay, um, so what you see then happening was these, these different kinds of phases. During the first phase, the Arabs and, well, uh, with the leadership of the Jews and the Christians, translated all the Greek uh, philosophical stuff, almost all of it. And then, slowly, the Arabs began to develop their own modes and thinking and ways of logic, if you will. They decided that um, Islamic law was the ruling science, and that should be um, the, what guides everybody in all situations, everywhere. And so they, they narrowed down the, the, the rules of logic and inference to what can be done in the way I describe using ijma, and, well, consensus scholars in analogy. And so that put a, a very definite limit on the ways in which you could think about things. Secondly, they rejected the idea of causality in nature, and so that limited their, them there too. Ah, now we forgot, I forgot something. We have to go back to the madrasas. Somewhere here. All right. Now, the other thing that happened was, okay, when we, we developed these, uh, this new um, science of law, right, that the, that the Islamic scholars developed, when that happened, they began to develop madrasas, and this means simply place of study. Now, it turns out that the madrasas only wanted to teach Islamic law, and Arab genealogy, Arab history, um, enough, enough arithmetic to um, do inheritance, because there are things in the Quran about how much each person gets, men, for, uh, sons get have twice as much as girls, daughters, and so on, and then the relatives can be involved too. So that was it. So they never brought into the madrasas um, the natural sciences. They weren't teaching the natural science. They didn't teach metaphysics. They didn't teach um, physics, meteorology, plants and animals, and all that stuff. Now, secondly, these uh, madrasas were pious endowments. That means that they were dedicated to the spirit and um, the will of God. Once they were created, a document was drawn up, and that was it. And it said who owned it or who built it and what it, was to, what it was to do. And that's the end. It cannot be changed. You can't change, well, didn't really have a curriculum, but you couldn't do anything in the madrasa that was against the spirit of Islam. Um, now, they were not legally autonomous the way universities came to be, because they didn't, they didn't have that concept of a legally autonomous entity. 
Um, what else do we have? Um, they had no faculty in any formal sense. Just self-appointed scholars would go there and they would sit wherever they would sit and they would have their students. And they would then um, get the students to memorize their particular documents. And after they had memorized that document and recited it back to the scholar, he would give them an ijaza, which means permission to transmit. So you always come back to this notion of transmitting something that's authentic. Right, because it comes from the word, comes from the mouth of, well, in one case, God, or from the mouth of the scholar. It's not a degree. It is it's a permission to transmit this particular document. So there's no formal cur curriculum. There's no group of scholars that say, okay, this is, the, this is what you must study, and now we will test you, and now we'll give you a degree. No, they didn't do that. That's a European thing. Um, so they just have the, the um, ijazah for it, which means uh, permission to tra transmit. So, you have then hey, the development of quite different modes of reason and logic, a different attitude toward the natural world, and then they create the madrasas, and in the madrasas, they are preserving the Islamic traditional sciences. The hadith and hadith commentaries, Quran, Quranic commentaries, and not doing the natural, natural philosophy and, and such. So you see, they put into place institution that preserved the tradition. It wasn't intended to go forward. It was intended to preserve what they had. And so that, again, puts further pressure on keeping things more or less as they, as they were. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to go a little bit forward. So, and we can take a break and get uh, to ask some questions here. But, um, okay. Yeah, these are the grades, and the, I give you various lists, I think, of these people. If you put this into your um, iPhone or whatever it is, you'll get Tusi's couple doing all its gyrations. It's not, not too exciting, but you can find it. And okay, this is, <laughs> this is, um, this is even Al-Shatya's diagrams, um, where he has the um, planets or this, <laughs> the movements of the, of the moon and so on and something else, all in concentric circles. Um, it's pretty, but it, it, isn't, it really isn't advanced on much of anything. Okay, I'm gonna skip this, and then, all right, back to Europe. Okay, so in the 12th and 13th centuries, now this stuff goes back to Europe, right? Goes um, through North Africa into Spain. Well, they begin translating stuff that was in Spain, uh, and it gets into Europe. And here are some of the translators. So we have lots of translators in, um, in Spain, and again, other Europeans, uh, you have both um, people from Germany, from England, from other places who come south and who get hands on, their hands on Arabic manuscripts and they translate them into, into um, Latin. And then uh, what they do is they put it into the curriculum of the universities. Okay, I guess we'll stop here and uh, see if there are questions about what we said so far. <laughs>